Good morning. The scripture that I would share with you this morning at the initially is found in the gospel according to John. And I'll be reading in uh, chapter 6, verses 53 through 58. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. May God bless this reading of his holy word, a, a curious passage of scripture, one that is sometimes hard to understand. But may he bless it to our hearing and to our understanding and to our growth toward him. In Jesus' name. Today is Lord's Supper Sunday. And all four of the Gospels uh, tell of that last Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. But Curiously enough, John's gospel says nothing about this communion or Lord's Supper that he instituted at the conclusion of that Passover meal. And people, uh, Christians, Bible students, pastors, theologians, and the average guy in the pew for some 2,000 years have wondered, well, why not? Why did he, why does John not... Tell us about it, anything about that. Well, I don't have the final answer for you. I can't give you a definitive why for why he didn't. But not knowing has never stopped me before from speculating. So I won't let it stop me today. I mean, it's possible. It's possible that uh, John, just since the other Gospels had already covered it, he saw no reason to take up the time, space, labor, and so forth to, to go over something that the three others had already talked about. It's also possible that although John doesn't specifically reference this Lord's Supper, that he had already given us the meaning of it even before the event happened. That's what today's message is about. John's explanation for the meaning of the Lord's Supper. And it begins well before that took place. It begins in the sixth chapter of John. Now in that chapter, in that chapter, going back to the beginning of it, a multitude of people had followed Jesus. They followed him from one side of the Sea of Galilee all the way over to the other. And in verse 2 of chapter 6, we read, A great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he performed on the sea. Okay, most of us read that verse and just say to ourselves, Okay, that's just giving us the setting for it. it it's just words. It's just a bit of a filler that is necessary to set the stage for what happens later. But that's not the good stuff. So we often think it's more than that. It's much more than that because it does set the stage, but it sets the stage for Jesus' explanation 
for everything which follows. And there's one, one reason, one primary reason why it's necessary for John to say this. He tells us why all the people were following Jesus. A great crowd followed him, yes. Why? Because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed. On the sick. That was why they were following him. They, weren't, they were following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. They were following him because he saw them perform these miracles. And in other words, they were following Jesus for the same reason that an earlier generation paid good money to watch Harry Houdini perform magic tricks. They were following him for the same reasons that today people pay money to go and, and watch people like David Copperfield or Penn and Teller or Chris Angel perform their tricks. They're looking for entertainment. That's what the people were following Jesus about. They wanted to be entertained. Well, Back then, people did believe in magic. Today, there are very few people, if any, who actually think that Copperfield or Penn and Teller or Angel or Houdini actually perform magic. There are very few people, if any, today who believe that. Back then, they did believe it, though. And maybe there was a second reason, too. Since they believed in magic, maybe some of them I uh, had a little avarice in their heart and thought, hey, you know, if Jesus pulls a coin out of my ear and I get to keep it, I'm ahead of the game. The multitude were there for the wrong reasons. And I want you to notice a word that's used in this verse. They followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. It's not the same word that in the other gospels are translated is translated as miracles. The word is literally sign. Now, what is a sign? A sign. If you're going down the road one winter, day, cold, cloudy, snowy winter day and you see a sign that says, Danger! Ice forms on bridge before it forms on the road. That sign is not the danger, is it? It's pointing ahead of itself to something that's even more important. That's the word that Jesus used here. Something that points ahead of itself to something else. That's even more important. And we're going to see this word repeated over and over and over again. Now the people, as I said, were following Jesus for the wrong reason. But despite that they were following him for the wrong reasons, and despite the fact that Jesus knew they were following him for the wrong reasons, he still had compassion upon them. He still had empathy for them. We read then in verses 10 and 11, here are all these, this multitude of people. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and the men sat down about 5,000 of them. I don't know if the women got to sit down or not. I know if it had been my wife, she would have. Jesus then took the loaves, five little loaves of bread, not great big loaves, probably about the size of a good-sized dinner roll you might get at a decent restaurant. He took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same 
with the fish and with those five little loaves of bread and it says two fish. We don't know the details of that. They may have been cold, broiled fish. They may have even just been pieces of dried fish. But with that, he fed this, this multitude of people, 5,000 men and an unknown number of women and children. Verse 14 then tells us after the people saw what? After they saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. They started following Jesus for the wrong reasons. Well, Maybe they're entering a different stage now. Maybe they're starting to, to see that there's something else about Jesus besides entertainment, besides providing them a little money, maybe. They knew that there was something more here, but it, it, they hadn't gone far enough in understanding the identity of Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They knew something was different about him. They were starting to wonder about his identity. Now, the next few verses, 16 through 24, they're important, but I'm going to skip over them for time's sake. The summary is this. Jesus left. Eventually, the people realized that he was gone, and they started looking for him again. <coughs> and eventually... Eventually, they found him. But when they found him, they started asking the wrong questions again. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me. Not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Something that Jesus has been working toward throughout this whole interaction with this multitude of people. He's been trying to move them toward a teachable moment. Moving them toward a point that they would start asking the right questions. He said to them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. It was an opening. It was a beginning. They didn't understand before even what questions to ask. Now they're starting to ask the right questions. Verse 28. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? They were starting to ask the right questions. Jesus answered, verse 29, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Amen. This is where it starts to get good. This is where it starts to get I'm going to make up a word here. 
This is where it starts to get communion-ish. <laughs> so they ask him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. To eat. Now, the only thing they could start with to, 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 to understand Jesus, to understand his, who he is, was to relate it to the Old Testament. That was their only frame of reference. And in the Old Testament, they could only relate it to receiving this mana from heaven. Mana. That seems to come from two Hebrew words, manhu, which literally mean, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. <clears throat> Do you know what mana was? What it is? I had a professor, Old Testament professor in seminary, and uh, when we got to that passage, he asked us, Do you know what mana is and you know we gave stock answers then he pulled out a, a big tin like candy might come in and opened it up and he said this is what some people think it is and we looked in there and there's this uh, stuff in it that looks a little like divinity if you know what divinity is only instead of being, you know, in pieces about like that, it's little seed-like pieces. And he started passing it around and said, take a piece, eat it. And everybody did. It tasted pretty good, a little bit sweet. Then he said, uh, this is something that is secreted by a certain insect that sometimes is found in the Arabic Peninsula over there. Something secreted by a bug. I don't know if that's what the people ate or not, but they still find it over there sometimes, and it's considered a great delicacy. Whether that's really what it was or not, it opened a door for them. This discussion opened a door to some real communication that it might take place. Verse 32 and 30 through 35, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Jesus then declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now that was a lot to take in. It, it, it was a whole different new thing for, for the people to think about. And there was a lot of back and forth after that. And then finally, after all this back and forth, after all this grumbling, Jesus said to them, verse 53, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. 
just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Amen. A lot of the people there didn't understand what he was trying to say, at least not then. I mean, it, it, it sounds like some sort of bizarre form of, of almost cannibalism. In fact, the Romans heard that later. And they said, That's just, that, that religion is just strange. But what Jesus is saying, he's using concrete words to represent symbolic truth. To live. To truly live. To live eternally, a person must be thoroughly enmeshed with Jesus. Thoroughly enmeshed with Him. It's not the Lord's Supper, but it is at least a foreshadowing and an explanation of what would happen at that Lord's Supper. To live, to really live, and to live eternally, it's necessary to be fully enmeshed with Jesus. If you, if you, each of you individually, if you at some point in your life have asked Jesus to come into your life, you realize the vast gulf that separated you from, from God. And you became willing to turn away, to turn away from all the things that separated you from God and invited Him into your life, then you, you are invited to partake in the Lord's Supper. And if you haven't done that, it's your opportunity. Because we're going to have a, an end time of invitation now. A hymn of invitation. And if there is a decision that God is calling on you to make, you are invited to come and share that. If it's something public. If it's something private, you're invited to make it right as you're sitting. It's your opportunity to profess Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we do thank you that you give us the true manna from heaven. Let us be worthy of it. Let us take as a symbol of the relationship we have with you. And if there's a man here, a woman here, a young person here who's never made, who's never asked you into their life, speak to that person that they may publicly profess you and take that true manna from heaven. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.